light out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. Joined in the studio with me is my co-host, Austin. What is up, man? Hey, how's it going? And behind the scenes, we've got my producer, Daniel. What's up, man? What's up, everybody? So today, we have got a very gruesome and disturbing case for you. This one, oh, not only is this case disturbing, grisly, but it's also, it made me extremely mad because the way that this one turns out will honestly blow your mind. But today we're going to be discussing the absolutely brutal murder of Tim McLean on Greyhound Bus 1170. Just forewarning, this one does get graphic. So if you got a weak stomach, this is definitely not the episode for you. And I'll give you another warning. Probably not a great one to be eating during. Absolutely. Just put it that way. But before we get into the episode, a couple of things. Make sure you're following the show on Spotify. It really does help us out. That is the premier podcast platform. You can also watch the episode in video form there now as well. If you're not following us on TikTok, we post a lot on TikTok as well at lights out cast but also this episode is brought to you by every play and higher love wellness check out the new sleep collection at higherlovewellness.com with all that out of the way we're just going to jump right into things here so this case is actually out of canada and the criminal justice system in canada is fucked up quite honestly i mean what happens to the suspect in this case truly blew my mind and I think it will and I think it will do the same thing for you with all that being said this is a story of the nightmare on Greyhound bus 1170 the man who beheaded a fellow passenger on a Greyhound bus may soon be walking the streets of Winnipeg unsupervised nearly seven years ago Vince Lee beheaded to Delhi's son Tim McLean on a Greyhound bus in western Manitoba and ate parts of his body. He was found not criminally responsible. Doctors believe he presents little risk to the public. I'm horrified by that. All of a sudden I heard a guy screaming. I turned around and the guy sitting right beside me was standing up and stabbing another guy with a, a Rambo knife. The guy was cutting off the guy's head. I thought it was just one of those scary movies. He feels great remorse. He feels great shame. Whether he was in his right frame of mind or not, he still did the act. There was nobody else on that bus holding a knife. Along a stretch of highway in south central Manitoba, about 11 miles west of Portage La Prairie, 34 passengers rode inside a Greyhound bus on July 30th, 2008. Unknown to them, they would all witness some of the most gruesome acts of violence Canada has ever experienced. One passenger would lose his life, and many of the others would suffer from PTSD for years. It's a gruesome tale of mental health, mutilation, and cannibalism. The horrors that took place on board won't soon be forgotten by the victim's family, the passengers, or anyone else who's heard of Greyhound Bus 1170. The 22-year-old Canadian man who lost his life was Timothy Richard McLean Jr. His friends and family called him Tim, and he came from a small farming community of Ely, Manitoba. From a young age, Tim was always active, and he always had the urge to go out and explore the world, and that carried on into his teens. Tim's mother, Carol Dedelli, said that Tim was her wild child. He was a free spirit and also an incredibly intelligent young man. He had read the entire library in his elementary school and felt so unchallenged that he dropped out of high school. He was so loved by his friends that if he said he was busy and couldn't hang out, they would all change their schedules just so that they could hang out with him. His friend Tiffany LaBelle described him as someone who couldn't sit down for very long and he absolutely loved socializing with people. His interest in people and adventures eventually led him to a job in the Western Canada Carnival Circuit. Tiffany ended up hooking him up with a job since she worked at the Red River Exhibition in Winnipeg, and to no one's surprise, Tim ended up fitting right in 
with the Canadian carny culture. He mostly worked as a carnival barker, which is someone who tries to get people interested in the shows, attractions, and games as the guests walk through the carnival. And he was so good at his job, he eventually got to run his own game. During a good week, Tim made about $1,000. But just as fast as he made the money, he would spend most of it partying with other carnies and buying bus tickets. After one carnival packed up, he would hitch a ride to the next town to find more work. In his late teens, he moved to live with his father, Tim Sr., and his stepmother, Nadine. He told them that his dream was to travel as much as he could and become famous one day. When he left home, he traveled across Canada as much as he could, and he often took the Greyhound bus from city to city. After traveling for a few years, he finally found a place he wanted to settle down when he was 22. He fell in love with the rugged coastline of British Columbia and the thousands of islands bordering the Pacific Ocean. And he often vlogged the places he visited. By the end of 2008, Tim had been working at Klondike Days Exhibition in Edmonton. And the next stop for his carnival work was Regina. But he decided he wanted to go home to Winnipeg for a while. While there, he planned on seeing some family and friends before making his final plans to move to British Columbia. But unfortunately, he would never make it there. When some of his friends offered to buy him a plane ticket from Edmonton to Winnipeg, Tim declined. It was an 800-mile journey, but he said he preferred to take the Greyhound bus. So right around midnight on July 30th, 2008, just outside of the Edmonton bus stop, the Greyhound bus 1170 prepared to leave. Tim loaded his luggage and found a seat along with everyone else. And just after midnight, the bus departed. It then began its long journey to Winnipeg. And this would end up being the last journey that Greyhound Bus 1170 would ever take. Among the other passengers on the bus was a 40-year-old man named Vince Lee. Vince was born on April 30th, 1968 in Dandong, China. He was often sick and fragile in his childhood years. But as far as we know, there is no history of mental issues. But he later graduated from the Wuhan Institute of Technology and got a job as a computer software engineer. He also married a woman named Anna in 1995. He then moved to Canada in 2001, where he later obtained Canadian citizenship in 2006. In 2004, his wife noticed he began acting strange. For several days, he didn't sleep and rarely ate. He cried often, and one time he told her that he saw God. She thought it was just from lack of sleep, so she got him some sleeping pills. In 2005, he returned to China briefly to divorce his wife. Sometime after this, he was institutionalized after being found by officers wandering the streets of Ontario. He claimed he was following the sun, and he said that God commanded him to do it. In 2005, Vince was diagnosed with schizophrenia. There's a lot to unpack with schizophrenia. It's a mental illness that we don't quite fully understand. Um, it was first identified more than a century ago. No one knows the exact causes, and it remains one of the most misunderstood mental illnesses to this day. So it's considered a syndrome, which means it might encompass a number of disorders, and each person who suffers from this has slightly different symptoms. When it first sets in, the symptoms are subtle. There's slight personality changes, irritability, or strange thoughts. Usually the patients are diagnosed only when psychosis begins to set in. And this is usually late teens, early 20s for men, or late 20s, early 30s for women. First psychotic episodes can feature things like delusions, hallucinations, and disordered speech and behavior. It's also a common misconception that people who suffer from this have multiple personalities, and that's not true. It has more to do with thought processes. So there's a handful of symptoms when it comes to schizophrenia, like lack of motivation, a lack of display of emotion or difficulty speaking, difficulty concentrating, memorizing, making decisions. And they think that there's likely not one cause of psychosis, but it's more of a combination. Things like genetics play a huge role in it or environmental risks. And uh, yeah, the one thing that they know pretty much for certain is that almost always genetically linked. So does that mean someone else in the family lineage yeah. suffered from schizophrenia? Yep. 
that's, because that's really interesting I, I didn't know that yeah because genetic links with it's that. actually a really rare mental illness only about one percent of all people suffer from it wow but if you have someone in your family that carries it you're something like 10 times more likely to have it yourself i wonder if there's a you know through genetic testing uh with like 23 and me and things like that right. you can do um a health analysis where they actually look at your um you know your genetics to see if you have those um, markers yeah. for different types of mental illness. I wonder if schizophrenia is on there. Yeah, I would wonder too. Um, and if not, I mean, you should be able to know the risk. I guess it's more about knowing. You know, if someone in your family had schizophrenia, there's it's a pretty you know likely chance that not likely chance, but you know that you risk passing that genetic material on. That's that's so interesting, and I and I think this is a relatively new discovery too because if you think about like 100 200 years ago if you had schizophrenia it's not like that was something they were diagnosing so you're right. just probably you know chalk it up to you're crazy or something right. like that they would so, probably just throw you in an institution and so how would understand. even people know if schizophrenia ran in the family like beyond the last couple of generations right? right yeah unless that was like a you know you know, great, great, great grandpa Carl was absolutely insane. Yeah, he was a bit he off heard his voices rocker. in his head. Yeah. I guess through stories and things like that, you might be able to to do that. Right. Yeah. Perhaps he had schizophrenia or something. But yeah. and sometimes, I mean, it's also possible that you know, if your parents didn't have it, it still might be somewhere in the bloodline. So it know? doesn't. It's not only a genetic thing. Right. Yeah. That it could just be completely random as well. Yeah. Or just you know, nobody knows the genetics existed in their family that's because what the way that i understood it is it's first of all they don't fully understand schizophrenia not for one no. they don't understand what the triggers are for it um completely and also it can just come and go at random so to speak yeah it's like they said they kind of have age ranges of when you will start to develop psychosis and you might have mild symptoms before that but it's hard to pinpoint and but there are cases of schizophrenia like i think of uh the slender man um stabbings mm -hmm. where she was a really young girl but her father had schizophrenia and i guess she was diagnosed at like a really young age right so even though they think they kind of have age ranges figured out we just don't know that much about it what well, i'm even thinking back to some of our possession episodes oh, that's yeah. always a, a theory that comes up is like did the individual was, were they actually possessed by some supernatural entity or was this a severe case of schizophrenia you know hearing yeah. voices and you know a demon taking you over and and with vince lee this is like the focal point really for him and this case this is that case he's is... you know he's starting to hear and see god but to me i'm like there's a lot of religious people who claim the same thing but don't have schizophrenia right so it's like I, I think as as you'll see as we get farther into this case that it's very difficult for me to necessarily believe i mean obviously there's diagnoses that come but could somebody fake having schizophrenia or pretend to have schizophrenia if they wanted to yeah i guess if they knew could. enough yeah i think you could i i don't know if that's the case here but right. i'll let i'll let the listeners uh decide for themselves but i think it would be pretty hard right. to do that but if you knew the ins and outs of the illness it's just like it because I, I guess it's beyond just like hearing voices and things like that there's actions that follow with it too but yeah yeah this this there's a lot of controversy with this case specifically yeah uh, especially surrounding vince lee's mental health yeah and i also what they never really i never figured out was why he left china in the first place and i wonder was it complications with mental health back then what happened back then that kind of set him off because he was set up you know he had a, a computer science degree and he could have made a lot of money back there but he did decide to come here and i'm not really sure why they never really explained why well and we know in canada the healthcare system is you know what is universal there so yeah that that could, could be a good theory in. that maybe you know he thought he could get better health care in canada or something yeah. i'm sure there's more to that story than we even know but right that's just one thought yeah
but yeah, so it is genetic. It's passed down that way. Um, they also think there are some environmental factors, like there are some illnesses or viruses when you're very young, when you're in your mm. infancy, they think might, they also think that certain recreational drugs, it won't give you the illness, but it will exacerbate it or speed up the process of, of if you're already inclined to have the mental illness, things like hallucinogenics and things like that. Yeah, I've definitely heard that. It makes sense. I mean, I'm sure, you know, taking LSD with, you know, knowing that you are potentially schizophrenic is not, not a good pairing. Yeah, there. not at all. Um, I had a friend growing up, he was actually in my band for a long time, but yeah, he had, we think hallucinogenics really sped his, he was eventually diagnosed with, he was a paranoid schizophrenic. Oh, wow. With bipolar disorder, but yeah, and that started basically the time frame that they give here, which is, I think it was around 18, so like. Yeah, it's always seems like teens, it's the 20s. later teen years is when it really starts to show, show yeah. itself. And so that was like, we think he was, you know, he smoked a lot of weed and he was doing a lot of acid at the time. We mm. think like that didn't help at all. Well, I mean, even for somebody who doesn't suffer from mental health issues, like you do enough psychedelics or hallucinogenics and you can easily experience psychosis absolutely and, yeah. um, have a psychotic break i mean <laughs> take enough when you and, see when you see reality start melting around you and you know all your senses are amplified and things like that i, I can definitely see how you can go down that that path absolutely sure. um so yeah again lsd hallucinogenics like that will not give you the mental illness right. it's mostly they believe it's all if you're already pre-existing pre so, yeah yeah um and there's always an emphasis, which is good in schizophrenia, there's always an emphasis on early treatment. Right when you think you have it or you were diagnosed with it, get it treated immediately because they think that if you let it simmer for so long, it'll become embedded in your personality. That's crazy. Yeah. So, and a lot of people don't get it checked out because there's a stigma around it. It's a it's since it's not well understood and people just have different takes on it and you lose friends and things happen. And there's also people think it makes you violent, which is a 99% of the time. It's a, it's a false stigma that it makes you violent. But if you're already prone to violence, your right. psychotic episode then can flare up, you mm. know? And that's a very important note to, to, it's, to keep for this one, especially sure. in this case. Yeah. Um, so it is really the case, but, Again, if you don't get it treated early on, it that's can a just problem. fester and and almost take 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 you over in a way. Exactly. Yeah. Last year, I can't tell you how much money I spent on delivery for food. So one of the things I'm trying to do this year is not order takeout or delivery as much as I did last year. And one way I'm doing that is by taking advantage of America's best value meal kit. That's every plate. What I love about every plate is its convenience and the cost. Not only is it 25% less expensive than grocery shopping, but with every plate, I just go onto the app or the website, pick out the meals that I want, and it's all shipped right to my door, pre-portioned so that I can get meals made in 30 minutes or less. And on those nights I get home from work a little bit late, they even have 15 minutes or less meals, including flavorful options like pimento style grilled cheese sandwiches and smoky cumin pork tacos. What's great about every plate is you can customize your meals to your liking. You can swap proteins and sides or add a protein to veggie dishes each week, which is amazing. I'm a huge fan of every plate. I've used them pretty much every week now, at least for three or four meals. And all the food is absolutely delicious. I never have any issues with the ingredients, but if you do, they get it swapped out and replaced in no time. So take advantage of their special offer they got going right now. Get $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code LIGHTSOUT149. Get started with EveryPlate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code LIGHTSOUT149. So in Vince's case, he tried to ignore his diagnosis and he left his schizophrenia untreated for years. He suffered from dramatic mood swings and would blurt out random things that no one could understand. After being released from the institution, he struggled to find a job, even though he had a high level of education in computer science. So he ended up doing odd jobs at Grant Memorial Church in Winnipeg. 
There he was actually baptized and he became a Christian. And he worked there for six months even though he struggled with the language barrier. The pastor of the church claimed he never ran into any problems while Vince worked there. After that he found a job as a forklift operator in 2006 and then moved to Edmonton without his wife. There he found a job at a local Walmart but was later fired in 2008 for an incident with another employee. He found one last job delivering newspapers just weeks before boarding that Greyhound bus. He brought on a few bags, a laptop computer, and a large hunting knife he had just bought before taking a seat. He had found the knife at Canadian Tire, and he bought it because the voice in his head, who he thought was God, told him that he was in danger, and the voice warned him about an evil alien that would try to kill him. Once he boarded the bus, he remained quiet and kept to himself. His plan was to take the bus all the way through to Winnipeg. But if he ended up doing that, he would have never come across Tim McLean. A bus from Edmonton to Erickson, Manitoba takes about 18 hours. When Vince's bus stopped in Erickson, his ticket would take him to Winnipeg and then on to Thunder Bay. But for whatever reason, he decided to get off the bus in Erickson. Later, he claimed that God told him to stay there. So he did. Erickson is a small town where visitors stand out so many of the locals noticed Vince. He carried his three pieces of luggage and found a spot on a nearby bench. As he watched a pickup truck drive down the street, Vince reached into his bag and clutched his knife. He thought that someone had been sent to kill him. A 15-year-old local named Darren Beatty was minding his own business pumping gas at his job right outside the grocery store when he noticed Vince sitting on the bench staring into space. At the time, he didn't think anything of it. But by the next morning, Darren noticed that Vince was still sitting on the same bench. And he watched as Vince put a brand new Acer 4200 laptop on the ground beside him. He taped a sign to it that read, $600 for sale or best offer. Darren then approached Vince and offered him $60 for it. Which to his surprise, Vince accepted the small offer. He noticed that Vince was still staring off into space and seemed a bit empty. But he remembered that Vince was fairly nice when he sold him the laptop. This would be Vince's last interaction with anyone in Erickson. He hadn't heard the voice in his head for a while, so he was unsure of what to do next. After spending a few days on the bench, he eventually decided to take the next bus through town on July 30th, 2008. And this was the infamous Greyhound bus, 1170. When he got onto the bus at 5.55 p.m., he sat near the front and kept to himself. He stared quietly out the window, dazing off into space. Many of the passengers on the bus had come from Edmonton and had been on the bus for almost 18 hours. Many were exhausted, bored, or asleep, like Tim McLean. He was seated toward the back of the bus, sleeping in the second to last row. For most passengers, nothing was out of the ordinary. It was just another boring day on the bus. Another passenger named Stephen Allison sat across the aisle from Tim McLean. Stephen had been traveling with his wife Isabel from the Northwest Territories to Winnipeg so they could start their college courses in the fall. He had taken the Greyhound buses to travel northern Canada all the time, and he later claimed he could tell something was off about Vince. He said he could feel something was going to happen, but he couldn't tell what. The bus eventually stopped for a lunch break in Brandon, and when all the passengers got back, Vince decided to switch seats for some reason. Stephen watched as Vince slowly walked down the aisle holding his belongings to his chest and he noticed Vince carefully looking at every single person on the bus almost like he was inspecting them. Vince eventually stopped at Stephen's row, a second from the back and looked across the aisle at Tim McLean sitting on the window seat. Tim gave Vince a friendly nod so Vince decided to sit down in that open seat next to him. Stephen's stomach began to turn and Vince made him feel very uncomfortable, but he wasn't sure why. The bus made its way back to the highway and Tim fell back asleep along with many of the other passengers. But Stephen couldn't get his mind off of Vince. The entire trip, Vince kept pulling out a two liter of tea and a roll of toilet paper that he kept obsessing over. He would put the roll of toilet paper under his chin and take small sips from the tea for hours. Occasionally he would rock back and forth chanting to himself, Stephen tried his best to keep to himself, but Vince's strange behavior kept bothering him. It got to the point that Stephen was afraid to get up from his seat because he didn't want Vince to target him. He wanted to warn the bus driver about the strange behavior, but he didn't know what to do. 
Meanwhile, it was getting dark outside, and the Greyhound bus played the movie Mask of Zorro on the TVs. None of the interior lights were on, so the only lighting was from the TV screens. As the bus rolled east through Manitoba, along the Trans-Canada highways, most of the passengers either slept or watched the movie, but Stephen couldn't do either. Vince's odd behavior had kept him on edge. Meanwhile, Vince also couldn't sleep or watch the movie. He was too fixated on his seatmate, Tim McLean. Vince then heard the voice in his head again, and he believed God told him to kill Tim. A moment later, Stephen watched in horror as Vince reached into his bag and pulled out that brand new hunting knife. This was the moment he knew that Vince had finally snapped. Vince looked through his sunglasses over at Stephen, clenching the knife in his fist. In that moment, Stephen believed he was going to die. But Vince then turned to his right, facing Tim McLean in the window seat where he had been sleeping. He then took that large hunting knife and began frantically stabbing Tim multiple times. Tim's desperate scream broke through the sound of the movie. Another passenger, 26-year-old Garnett Caton, who was sat just ahead of Tim, later told his experience to news reporters. Here's some of that interview. The victim screamed. Did he wake up? Did he yell? Yeah, the victim was. It was a blood curdling scream. Like that. Just reading my book, and all of a sudden I heard it. It was like something uh, between a dog howling and a baby crying. I guess you could say it was. I don't think it'll be. It'll leave me for a while. Uh, after I don't know five or six stabs, I think he must have got him in the throat because we didn't hear him anymore. Um, I was just reading a book. All of a sudden, I heard a guy screaming. I turned around, and the guy sitting right next beside me was standing up and stabbing another guy with a big a Rambo knife, pretty much. It was a big survival knife like this in the throat, repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Uh, told everybody to get off the bus. Everybody started to get off the bus. Uh, the guy step, kill step, or still kept stabbing him, stabbing him. When the stabbings began, Stephen Allison's first impulse was to run up the aisle and get all the other passengers away from Vince. He yelled to the bus driver telling him to pull over to the side of the road, and he told everyone to get off the bus as fast as they could. All of the passengers jumped up from their seats and began shoving each other toward the doors. They began screaming and crying in the aisle. Some even vomited at the sight of Vince brutally stabbing Tim to death. As Stephen looked back, he saw three people in the back row of the bus trapped behind the chaos. It was a mother, her young son, and Stephen's wife, Isabel. As he rushed back to his wife, he had to climb over the seats as other passengers crowded the aisle. Some of the teenagers tried pulling out their phones to record, but they were pushed toward the door. He could see his wife was paralyzed with fear, trapped behind Vince. The flash of his knife could be seen every time he raised it into the air before stabbing Tim again. Stephen then watched as Tim pushed himself up from a seat covered in blood and he jumped over Vince, out into the aisle, but he stumbled to the ground. Vince then crawled on top of Tim and continued to stab him, over and over. Stephen assumed Tim had been stabbed nearly 60 times by this point, and Stephen realized that there was nothing he could do for Tim. So he climbed over the seats to try and get to the back of the bus where his wife and the other two passengers were trapped. People were screaming and crying as they escaped the bus. Meanwhile, a truck driver named Chris Alguar was also on the Trans-Canada Highway heading home, and he noticed the bus pulled over on the shoulder. He figured something must have been wrong since people were running out of the bus. As he pulled over, a woman came screaming from the bus, yelling that someone was being stabbed to death. Chris then jumped out of his truck and grabbed a heavy metal bar from the trunk. Then Chris, the bus driver, and another passenger boarded the Greyhound to try and help, but there wasn't much they could do. When they looked down the aisle, they saw Vince Lee, and Chris noticed that he looked empty inside. His face showed no emotion as he was covered in blood, clutching the knife in his hand. He stood beside Tim McLean's motionless body, sprawled on the floor in the bus aisle. Chris later admitted that he never wanted to hurt someone so bad in his entire life, and that still hasn't changed to this day. The men then watched as Vince kneeled down over Tim's body, took the hunting knife to the throat and began sawing off Tim's head. Vince then lifted Tim's head into the air once it was beheaded, clenching the hair in his fist. 
In his other hand, he held a bloody hunting knife. He then began walking toward Chris and the other men who had boarded. The men backed out of the bus and barricaded the door so Vince was trapped inside. But just before the bus door closed, Vince took the knife and tried to stab the men. He then stared at the men before dropping Tim's severed head to the floor. Chris later said the decision was tough. He knew people were counting on him to stop the madness. And as much as he wanted to charge in and attack Vince, he decided it was best to stay outside with the others. As the terrified passengers were now safe outside the bus, they could see Vince through the bus windows. He paced up and down the aisle, still carrying the head. As they watched, many were crying, and some even began to vomit on the side of the road. Meanwhile, the voice inside of Vince's head continued, and Vince later said, I don't know if I did the right thing. God commanded me, but it was my own hands, so I must die. God told me to put the body as far away as possible, or it would come back to life and kill me. At this point, Vince believed that an evil force had possessed Tim's body. After this, his violence intensified. With the hunting knife, Vince cut open Tim's chest and tore out his organs. He broke through his ribs and began eviscerating his chest. He removed Tim's heart, lungs, liver, and all of his intestines. He then dragged the pieces of the body across the Greyhound bus and strung them across the seats, the aisle, and the windows. The passengers watched as Vince carried around the body parts like they were his special prizes. Meanwhile, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or the RCMP, surrounded the Greyhound bus 1170, but none of the officers attempted to board it. So Vince was free to do whatever he wanted with Tim's remains. In their radio relay, they nicknamed the suspect Badger and they reported to the other officers that Vince had begun to defile and eat parts of the body. He would even lick Tim's blood off of his fingers. But the RCMP decided to play the waiting game. Even though they knew Vince was defiling and eating Tim's body, and they decided to just wait outside the bus as the hours passed. Eventually, Vince ate both of Tim's eyes and a third of his heart. He also cut off Tim's nose and ears. He then got up and stared out the window. He looked out at the audience he had gathered before showing them the severed body parts. He then dramatically smelled the mutilated body parts and continued licking more blood off his fingertips. During the standoff, RCMP brought in special negotiators and a heavily armed tactical unit. All the while, Vince paced back and forth inside the bus, taunting police by continuing to defile and eat the corpse. Strings of meat hung out of his mouth and blood ran down his chin and neck. He then brought out several plastic bags and began storing some of Tim's remains inside. He planned to take these with him. After watching the string of horrors, the stranded passengers on the side of the highway were eventually transported to the Brandon RCMP detachment for questioning. What's absolutely mind-blowing to me is that by this point the police still refused to enter the bus and subdue Vince. During negotiations, one of the officers overheard Vince say that he was going to stay on the bus forever. Meanwhile, the truck driver, Chris, urged the police to do something about it. He tapped on one of the SWAT officers carrying a semi-automatic rifle and yelled at the officer to shoot Vince. He also pointed out that if they didn't want to kill him, they did have tear gas and plenty of other non-lethal weapons to take him out, or at least disable him. But they remained outside the bus and did nothing. Police had first got the phone call that a stabbing had occurred at 8.30 p.m. that night. By this point, nearly five hours had passed. And finally, at 1.30 a.m. on July 31st, 2008, Vince finally tried to escape the bus. He ended up breaking through a window and crawled out. But RCMP was there waiting for him. And they immediately tased Vince twice and then sicked a canine unit on him. At that point, they were able to handcuff him and place him in the back of a police cruiser. When they searched him, they found Tim's bloody nose, ears, and tongue stuffed inside of his pockets. At that point, they followed policy and transported Vince to a nearby hospital since they noticed that he had injured himself. Later that morning, they investigated the bus where the police found pieces of Tim McLean's body scattered all across the aisle, seats, and windows. The horrific case hit news headlines before sunrise. And investigators began searching through the bus, collecting pieces of Tim's remains 
There, they also found his nose, ear, and part of his mouth stuffed into the plastic bags. The problem was, Tim's body was so disfigured that they weren't able to identify the victim, and he actually wouldn't be identified for nearly 24 hours. Meanwhile, Greyhound representatives took the passengers to a local store around 10 a.m. to get them new clothes. Since all their luggage was still on the bus, it was now being confiscated for evidence. Then they finally transported the passengers to Winnipeg to reunite them with their friends and family members at 3.30 p.m. But Tim McLean's friends and family noticed that he never arrived. Tim Sr. had last heard from Tim around 7.30 p.m. the day before. Tim had asked his father if he could come home for the night, and his father said of course he could. Later that day, Tim Sr. expected his son to be home for dinner. So he went out and got him his favorite meal, a bucket of fried chicken. When Tim Sr. returned home, a few of Tim's friends arrived. They asked him if he had heard what had happened. When he said no, Tim's friends sat Tim Sr. down at the computer and showed him the headlines. Tim Sr. then tried to get confirmation from the police that the victim of this bus attack was indeed his son. He then tried to reach out to his current wife, Nadine, who was actually on an Alaskan cruise at the time. Then he reached out to Tim's mother, but wasn't able to get a hold of her. But Tim's mother, Carol Dedelli, actually had heard the news report earlier that day. But at that point in time, the victim's name wasn't released yet. She had a feeling around lunchtime that the victim might have been her son, but she shrugged it off. She believed Tim had already made it back to Winnipeg. Carol then went to cook dinner at the local senior's home later that day. And before they all sat down for dinner, the news was on. When they said grace, they prayed for each of the victim's families. And Carol even mentioned that it could have been her own son who had died, not realizing that it actually was her Tim. Around 7.30 p.m., she got a call from her ex-husband, Tim Sr. He said that the victim hadn't been positively confirmed yet, but as far as he knew, the victim was their son. Carol screamed through the phone, telling Tim Sr. not to say it. She then ran out the door, thinking she was going to vomit. Once she got outside, all she remembered was screaming no at the top of her lungs. From that day on, Tim's mother, father, and stepmother all struggled with getting the image of their son's murder, mutilation, and cannibalism out of their heads. And as the details of the incident came to light, Tim's relatives desperately needed someone to be held accountable for this horrific crime. As for Carol, she believed some of the accountability involved the police's response. She understood that the RCMP has a preservation of life policy, and Tim was already dead. But how did they just sit and watch as Vince ate Tim's eyes and heart without doing anything? It was already horrific losing her son the way she did, but now she had to deal with the thought of her son's body being mutilated and consumed. In an interview, she emphasized how there were police at the scene only 10 minutes after the attack. And rather than storming the bus and stopping the carnage, the police did nothing for four hours and 48 minutes while Vince mutilated and ate her son. Ever since the night that Tim was murdered, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police have said very little about their strategy that night. They allowed Vince Lee to remain on the bus for hours while he abused and defiled the corpse. In response, the McLean family filed a civil lawsuit against the RCMP. The family also blamed the Greyhound Company and Transport Canada for lack of security, as they had allowed Vince Lee to board bus 1170 with a lethal weapon. But as for many of the locals in Manitoba, Vince Lee held sole responsibility for what had happened that night. They thought Vince was criminally responsible in every way. And even though he might have been in a psychotic state, they don't believe it would have lasted for days. They didn't believe he was in a psychotic state when he purchased the weapon or brought plastic bags onto the bus to hold the body parts. One week after the murders, Vince was brought to the psychiatric ward of the Health Sciences Center in Winnipeg. Manitoba's chief forensic psychiatrist, Stanley Aaron, assessed him. Vince confessed everything and told him about the commanding voices in his head. The doctors gave him proper medication and soon his schizophrenia symptoms died down. During this time, Vince could speak about the incident more clearly. He told Dr. Aaron, quote, I am the evil son of an evil god. God chose me as a killer, 
and chose Tim McLean as a victim. When the doctor asked him why, he responded that he didn't know. He just said, God controls all people for his own reasons. But even in the early session with Stanley Aaron, Vince understood that he was charged with murder and believed he was responsible for Tim's death. He also expected that the trial would find him criminally responsible too. During the interviews with Stanley, Vince kept asking if the Canadian government had the death penalty, and every time Stanley told him, no, Vince would get angry. Vince then said, I have taken a life. God said I must die. God said I must kill myself. After 19 sessions in the psychiatric center, Stanley Aaron prepared his assessment for the court. They had to determine if he was fit to stand trial and if he was criminally responsible for the crimes. Stanley was aware that the victim's family and the public were watching him closely, as there was an incredible amount of pressure on this case. He knew it was easier for the public to believe that monstrous things are done by monsters because it distances ourselves from what's happened. But he believed that if you put yourself in his mind and his reality, he acted according to what his beliefs were. He believed he needed to defend himself against an evil attack, an evil alien. When the trial began, Vince slowly walked into the courtroom. Everyone could see he was burdened by emotion and he was even heard whispering, please kill me. The defense pled not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder. Since the nature of the case was to determine Vince's mental state, the court had a closed trial. They didn't call in any of the eyewitnesses or the family. The prosecution, the defense, and the psychiatrists who testified all agreed that Vince couldn't be held criminally responsible for what he did due to psychosis caused by schizophrenia. Even though Vince previously said he wanted to be executed, it never happened. Canada does not have a capital punishment, and in the eyes of the court, Vince was not criminally responsible. So to expand on what not criminally responsible means. Um, yeah, what is this nonsense? Yeah, right. <laughs> My God. In Canada's criminal code, a person cannot be found criminally responsible, quote, for an act committed or an omission made while suffering from a mental disorder that rendered the person incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of the act or omission or of knowing it was wrong. So the most important part of that quote, which is a bit confusing, the most important part to focus on is the second part of it, which says mental disorder, which renders the accused incapable. So basically in this case, if Vince didn't know what he was doing or he didn't know what he was doing was wrong, then he could be found not criminally responsible or NCR. And turns out schizophrenia is one of the most common mental illnesses when it comes to NCR. Um, and I have a little clip that we can play that expands on this idea. This is a lawyer, right? Yeah, Explain this is a uh, defense lawyer, Joe Newberger. Frankly, our law is premised to a large extent on intent. If you have the mental intent to commit the crime, what happens with people who suffer from serious debilitating mental illness do not have the intent to commit the crime according to the actual char charge that they have before them. So in this case, murder is not this individual who thought he was killing another human being who was just on the bus with him and he just felt that day that he wanted to kill this individual. Unfortunately, he suffered from a very serious mental illness in which he thought that there was a demon and that he was compelled to do this as a result of that mental illness. So this individual is suffering and laboring under this type of defect. He does not have the intent for what would be normally first or second degree murder. This is by no means leniency. They have to go into a mental health system. These systems have security ratings, minimum, medium, maximum. And somebody who suffers from such a mental illness right. may be in this system for quite a while. This, this to me is the most baffling part of this case. Because to me, I see all the intent there. I mean, if you look at the evidence, you look at the fact that he purchased this knife, he bought the he brought the baggies onto the bus with him. So does that not is that not intent? Right. Like you intended on killing somebody, and just because there's this mental illness factor, 
like you alluded to earlier, just because you're schizophrenic doesn't necessarily mean you're prone to commit violent acts. Right. And so to me, this there is absolutely intense to kill somebody that day. Yeah, and, and he methodically thought it out. That's what the public thought too, because it's like, I guess a big question is, since we don't understand this mental illness so much, how long does a psychotic episode last? Right, right. Because And when did it start? Exactly. At what point did this psychotic state actually start to where he was intending to kill somebody? Yeah, because if he had, and obviously, you know, he was, whatever voice was in his head told him to get off that first bus. Yeah. And then he waited on a bench for a while. And armed. Then he, and He's then he armed was, the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And then so, he was saying that the voice eventually stopped and he didn't know what to do. So was was he going in and out of psychotic right, episodes? Right. Like when was he lucid and doing things? And then when was he afflicted by his mental illness? And that's something they just can't. Yeah, I don't know how, how, how do they, figure, that they out. figure that out. I mean, it, you got to also remember to, I mean, he's armed from basically the time that he gets on the first bus to the time he's arrested. And there is even a point where he got off one of the first buses or even at like rest stops to smoke and he would like hang out with other people. Yeah. And he seemed, and so fine. he seemed completely fine. So why not commit the murder at any other point in time? It seems like, he waited for the perfect conditions to exist as well. All the lights are off. There's a movie on. He's in the back of the bus. His victim was in the back of the bus. Sleeping. Sleeping. Yeah. Right. The most He found the perfect victim. And to me, I'm just like, how can you conclude that this was all just a, you know, due to a psychotic break when he was methodically planning out each step, it seems like, of this murder? I mean, he knew. Did God tell Vince to dissect the body and collect these body parts. As far as we know, he never said anything along those lines. He said that he had to make sure the body was dead because it could come back to life. But at no point did he receive a message from God. I want you to pull the heart out. I want you to eat the body. Like none of that is there. And so I I just really struggle with how they are putting this all on the mental illness yeah, and, and not any on this fact that he's prone to violence from, from the jump. And I think a big issue with it is like, if, even if he was going through something, there are things like forensics, which is like physical evidence that you can go to a crime scene, you can collect and analyze. You can't retroactively go back in time and analyze Vince's state of mind. It's impossible we can barely analyze people's states of mind currently in the present. So how are we going to do that retroactively in the past? It seems incredibly difficult that they can come up with this conclusion. So the thing that keeps popping into my head that's similar to this sort of situation that we have here in the United States is women experiencing postpartum uh, depression and the way that postpartum depression affects the mental health of women after birth is insane like i i I saw from firsthand experience my wife and just it's a real thing like i was always like oh you know beforehand i was like i didn't really know much about it i was just like you know how bad can it be well it can be really fucking bad to the point where mothers kill their children yeah i've heard of that and oftentimes they're able to prove that it was due to this postpartum. And so they actually don't face any criminal charges, right. even though they murdered their children. And so to me, that that's, I guess, an example of, of something similar-ish that exists in, in the United States criminal justice system as, a, you know, as opposed to how they do things in Canada. In Canada, they take it one step further and kind of like say all mental health. Like if you if you're able to if it's been proven that you are suffering from a psychotic breakdown during the crime, then you can't be criminally held responsible for it. But at the same time, I I feel like there's a major difference between, you know, women and postpartum and it's a much more researched and we know a lot more about it. We know what brings it on and and all these things versus like schizophrenia and some of these other mental health disorders. 
it's like how much do we actually really know and with some of those other things and, and even there's cases where women try to i think there's one case i can't remember the name of it right now but there's one case that's going on where because of the it, it's a similar type of situation where there's other circumstances surrounding it so in this other case this woman after she killed her kids jumped off of the second uh floor balcony tried to kill herself but what they found what they were starting to find out is that she had methodically had her husband go on this long trip to the store or some far away place to get something to give herself enough time to make all this go down and what's crazy is that this mother survived she survived Damn. the fall and is now being charged with murder even though she's claiming that this it was this postpartum mental health issue that she was having and so right now they're trying to prosecute her for homicide and she's obviously trying to fight that but she went in a coma and everything and yeah it was just it's crazy but it's kind of a similar situation where at first glance maybe you could say vince did these things due to his mental illness and he had the psychotic break due to the schizophrenia but then when you start kind of dissecting it a little bit more and you start looking at some of the other circumstances and, and evidence that's there you start realizing that was it just that or was this the plan the entire time? Was this almost a suicide mission? The way that I'm looking at this is like he wanted to die. His ultimate goal was to die of, as a result of this. And I think honestly, he thought the police were going to kill him on that bus. Yeah, I think suicide by cop was definitely suicide by cop was yeah. what the final plan was. And I'm just I have a hard time thinking that somebody who's who's just taking messages from a voice in their head is going to go through the trouble of like getting baggies and collecting body parts and and is going to pick their victim as as well as he did in this case. It just to me I don't I'm not buying it. Yeah, and thinking back on um Darren Beatty, the little the I think he was a teenage kid yeah, the who 15 year old, yeah. who walked up to him and by that point according to Vince, he was already experiencing the voices in his head and the voices were telling him something might be coming to attack you at any moment. Yet this kid was able to come up light a day right. approach him by the laptop which was the laptop some sort of lure why didn't he attack darren when the voices were telling him at that moment something might be coming to kill you yet right. he, he had the ability to decide that darren somehow wasn't a threat but tim the guy sleeping how is he was? more of a threat yeah i don't I that don't doesn't make it. any sense to me and i guess maybe it's just the nature of mental illness that it it just doesn't make sense right. in the end of end of the day. So I don't know. This seems like it would be incredibly difficult to pinpoint when he was. That's what I'm saying though, is like, because it's so incredibly difficult, how do you know either way, which it is? Yeah. And how can you just go so hard in one direction when there's a very real possibility that this was a calculated murder, right? And you're using the mental illness as sort of his, his escape and he's literally over here begging for death to die yeah. like why aren't they taking that into consideration this guy's suicidal in essence and i mean i think s suicidal ideation is part of schizophrenia uh, a symptom of schizophrenia but still it's like how are they not taking this into account and not only that how are you not taking into account the brutality of the act that vince did that and seems the to be victim's the... family is not even factored one bit in this this case at all. Yeah, they are not even allowed to make a statement on what they want. Yep, at all. They're mm -hmm. like cut everybody out, and they're like, we only care about Vince at this point and Vince's well being. It's like, well, what about Tim? Poor Tim didn't even see it coming. He even have a chance, right? And yet he's getting no, not even a shred of attention from. From the canadian government or the justice system it's like what about what about tim how how do we get justice for tim they're like well unfortunately there's no option for that because this is just a, a mentally ill individual so we've got to treat this guy and they're more worried about getting vince help getting him to the hospital and all this bullshit. it's just it's insane to me that they they went this route so like i mentioned before everyone involved in the trial the prosecutors the criminal defense team basically all the experts involved all believed that Vince needed to be in a psychiatric hospital and that he couldn't be held criminally responsible. 
As for Tim's mother, Carol Dedelli, she disagreed. She wanted Vince Lee to be held responsible, and rightfully so. She said, quote, whether he was in his right frame of mind or not, he still did it. He still did the act. There was nobody else on that bus holding a knife, slicing up my child. After this, Carol petitioned to change this not criminally responsible laws for years, and even to this day. And she stated her case in front of the Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Here's a clip of her. I believe that there needs to be transparency and accountability within the institutions and the professionals caring for these offenders. We need to establish, implement, and enforce a legal mechanism that would require these mentally ill, medication-dependent individuals to treat their illnesses. Failure to do so would result in criminal charges of foreseeable gross negligence causing death. That there, that way there would be a criminal record. Victims' families would have some sense of justice having been served. The offender gets the treatment he clearly re requires, and the safety of the community can be ensured. I just got to say, she's so brave and just badass, honestly, for taking the fight to the government because I 100% agree with what she just said. And then I think she's even trying to still be you know, looking out for those that are mentally ill at the same time versus, you know, just holding someone responsible for what they did, no matter their, you know, mental health. Yeah, and she's incredibly well-spoken too for being a victim's mother, um, which could just have so much emotional rhetoric in, in her speeches, but she's very level-headed and kind of gets to the point. Carol eventually gave up on the petition she named Tim's Law in 2014 because only 1,200 people had signed the petition, which is insane to me but she said she would still fight for change. She also said, quote, a killer is a killer. If you take a life, you forfeit your freedom for the rest of your life. The only thing that should change with a mentally ill killer is that they should serve their sentence in a place where they can also receive treatment. She also said, I need Vince Lee and people like him in a locked facility where they can make sure that they get their medications, where they are being treated for their illness. They are treated with compassion, but the rest of the public is also kept safe. That's what I need to move forward. Carry on. I'll never get my son back regardless of what I do or what I've already done. After his trial, Vince Lee was housed in Selkirk Mental Health Center where he was given therapy and medication to treat his schizophrenia. To understand what these medications actually are a little bit better, antipsychotic drugs have helped researchers kind of work backwards and trace signatures in the brain of the certain disorder traditional antipsychotics block dopamine receptors if you know anything about uh, mental health medication these these words will kind of be dopamine serotonin these should kind of ring a bell if you've ever dipped into this um, they can be very effective in reducing positive symptoms that are linked to an excess of dopamine in brain pathways but unfortunately, these drugs can also make symptoms worse. Like we talked about before, this illness is not understood well. Neither is the medication, but it's, it's the best we have. Um, they think this might be the cause of too little dopamine in other areas of the brain. These drugs might also cause a loss of neural tissue. Luckily, newer medications try to target multiple neurotransmitters like serotonin because no single transmitter system is responsible for all sy symptoms. But despite the complications, these drugs can be very effective, especially alongside behavioral therapy, which is important. Um, some practices have even brought back, this surprised me, some practices have even brought back electroconductive therapy to treat illness alongside medication or if the patient doesn't respond to medication. So this is essentially how you treat someone with schizophrenia. Medication, behavioral therapy, occasionally you can do electroconductive therapy. Mm. Um, but that's essentially what they did to him when they sent him to the institution. Yeah, I wonder what some of those drugs are actually called. I wonder if I, I've ever heard of them. I know one of the most promising treatments for these types of conditions is ketamine, actually. Ketamine's a really interesting drug because it actually reconnects those neural pathways and connects new ones that were never that. connected and you know like my wife she's actually gone through ketamine treatments and you do like six different rounds over a number of weeks and 
it, it was uh, honestly the results were astounding and, and i've seen a lot of very promising research come out of ketamine and now obviously they're starting to experiment with psilocybin for treating mental health and so yeah you know that it's it's very real um you know i've i've been with people including people in my own family who have struggled with mental health issues and depression's been something that's run through my family in the, in the past and and i just i know it's a real thing and so it's 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 difficult because obviously somebody who's mentally ill you want them to get the treatment you want them to get better but at the same time this is what's absolutely insane about canada versus the united states is like in the united states if you for example james holmes you were a theater shooter yeah mentally insane i mean people question whether or not he was putting on an act things like that in his uh, some of the interrogation in, you know footage and interviews that he gave afterwards but he was basically found you know to be mentally you know lots of disorders i can't remember exactly what he was diagnosed with but i, I want to say it was either schizophrenia or some, some other ones but the difference is he is locked away for the rest of his life yeah in a psychiatric facility mental health hospital something something like that but he's never going to re-emerge into society which if he did, people would be up in arms here in the United States. But this is where Canada differs. So what's crazy is that Vince Lee was actually allowed supervised leave in 2010. He was then allowed unsupervised leave as early as 2012. In June 2014, he began living in a halfway house where his supervisors noticed he exhibited no problems. By the next year, he was allowed to visit Winnipeg as long as he carried a phone on him. And in February 2017, eight years after going to trial, the review board made a decision that sent waves through the justice system. After considering the victim's impact statements several times during previous board meetings, Vince Lee was granted an absolute discharge. His emails that he sent to his family in China were later translated into English. He said he was happy to be free and talked about beautiful free skies in Canada, but he also felt guilty that he had left China. After an absolute discharge, he was let go, and his criminal record was expunged. So this horrific crime he had committed literally expunged off his record. It's like he never did it. Plus, there is no legal recourse if he ever stopped taking his medication, which is absolutely insane to me. Vince was also able to change his name to Will Baker, which I believed wherever he was being housed the government actually assisted him in doing this to help him go on with his life. Chris Somerville, executive director of the Manitoba Schizophrenia Society, worked with Will Baker for several years. Here's what he had to say. He said that he's no longer a violent person. I will say yes, he absolutely understands that he has to take his medication and has a desire to live a responsible moral life and never succumb to psychotic episodes and not to hurt anybody ever again. One of the psychiatrists said that he had only a 0.8% chance of a relapse. Vince or Will Baker hadn't exhibited psychotic symptoms since 2009. He planned to stay in Winnipeg for the next two or three years, and he was on a waiting list for a post-secondary training course and planned on having a career in the city. According to Chris Somerville's transcript, he quoted Will Baker saying, I understand people are scared because of my behavior on the Greyhound bus. I am not at risk for anybody. I don't believe in aliens. I don't hear voices. I take my medication every day. I'm glad to take it. I don't have any weird voices anymore. He also said I would be glad to be under a treatment order because medication helps me. It is very important. I don't want to do what I did ever again. Imagine being Tim's family finding out that the killer who cannibalized your son is now free to live his life however he wishes and there's virtually no restraints on him yeah and the killer himself is saying i wish i was put under a medical yeah, order he went yeah he's literally i can't believe you're letting me the, yeah do this. he's like this is he's crazy. surprised yeah which i'm like literally the government is freeing a killer all because they it's it almost seems like it's this oh well we fixed him you know we rehabilitated him 
where does this 0.8% stat come from? I'm like, what? There's only a 0.8% chance on what study is that I don't based even on? Know how you quantify how that? How do you quantify yeah. that? That doesn't make any sense. That sounds like some PR bullshit to me. Like, yeah. Th- oh, how do you also, guys know that this guy's not going to go do something again? Also, they're admitting that there is a chance of relapse, yeah. which blows my mind. If there's mind. even a 0.001% chance, why the fuck is this guy not locked up still? Makes no sense. And how could you rest easy? being anybody on that bus knowing that this guy who you had just witnessed doing one of the most heinous things a human being can do to another how could you i mean we're talking about long-term ptsd which we'll kind of get into here in a a bit they witnessed this dude beheading someone if you've ever seen someone be beheaded which i hope you have not i made the mistake of watching an isis video back in high school And I watched somebody be beheaded and it was, it took me a long time to shake that, that image. It is, I mean, it is the most disturbing thing I think you can potentially watch. And these individuals, we're talking mothers, children, other adults watched him behead Tim, rip him apart, eat him. And yet this guy's able to get a second chance of life. Like what on earth? Yeah. Just because they claim to have cured his mental illness makes absolutely no sense to me. I feel like uh, if they totally believed in this, I'd be interested in to see how many of those psychiatrists would let Vince live or will live in their own house. Seriously. Yeah. Why don't you bring him into your, and I guarantee you they wouldn't. Yeah. I guarantee you. It's, it's almost like this, it's, I feel like there's ego wrapped up in this. Like, it's like, oh, well, you know, you know, they all, all these psychiatrists come out and say all this stuff and, you know, oh, you know, we did this and that. And now he's a, he's a reformed member of society. He's going to go on and do great things. And he's never going to, he's basically never going to relapse again. It's like, even though they admitted there's a chance he could relapse, it's just, it, it feels like this ploy to try to like seem like they, they've got this system and, you know. Yeah, it seems like it's like, let's back off. No tough on crime. They knew that this case was headlines across the world. So they're like, let's kind of make him now a figurehead on rehabilitation. Rather than actually addressing the problems, I think it was more of almost like a campaign, like a marketing campaign that's what, for that's how what I was we trying rehabilitate to, people. To get to is like, it seems like they try to make this a bigger thing for themselves and yet, Never did they once see how Tim's family felt about it. What about them? Right. What do they get out of this? They literally lost their son in the most brutal way possible. Like, can you imagine if that happened here in the United States? People would be rioting if that were to happen. Yeah. Mentally ill or not, that would just, there's just no way that that would ever fly here in the United States, especially if it was something as horrific as, as what Vince did. There's just no way. So, obviously, the news of his release sparked a very heated debate across the country. Tim's mother, Carol, obviously disagreed with the release. She said that the psychiatrist cannot guarantee the future behavior of any individual. And she said that's how they absolve themselves of any responsibility. And she thought all the government accomplished was pointing fingers. I want to quickly play you a little clip that kind of summarizes this whole back and forth argument about, you know, treating mental health. Should they be released back into society? So here's Shelley Glover, a conservative member of parliament and Deborah Parks from the University of Manitoba. I believe she's a psychiatrist or um, in that field. So let's take a look. Minister Shelley Glover is worried too, but not about Lee's safety. In a statement, she says, It's unacceptable that dangerous and violent offenders are released into our communities when they pose a threat to society. We made changes to the Not Criminally Responsible Act to ensure that dangerous offenders at risk of reoffending are kept behind bars where they belong. Those decisions are made in a very um, conservative, small c conservative way. This expert um, disagrees would... with Glover. The review board's foremost consideration is public safety and they do exercise that in a very risk averse kind of way so if you're seeing a decision like this one where there is some graduated risk it's because there's overwhelming evidence how can you guarantee the safety of the public you can't yeah that's just straight up false it's just like 
again, it goes back to this almost seems like marketing ploy to be like, oh, you know, we've got a great system here that, you know, we can, we conduct this risk analysis and basically it seems like they're going to be just fine. Yeah. They, and there's no risk to the public. They really, really, really want Vince or Will to be better. Like, hey, we fixed this guy. Look at what the horrors that he's done and you don't ever worry about him again. We got this. We that, did it. That would just be so terrifying if that happened here in the United States. Can you imagine if they let James Holmes out and yeah. he got to just rejoin society? He's been he's been uh, rehabilitated. His mental health's good. He can go. Are you kidding me? Yeah. He would be dead. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there would be a lynch mob. Which I'm like, what's the point of changing his name if you're going to release his name? If that's in fact his real Vince's real new name, right, would you, yeah. Will? Like, why would you even release that? What's the point of that then? Yeah, right. And it seems like he anglicized it for maybe a strategic reason. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, besides, obviously, the Deborah was against NCR. A lot of the critics, obviously, they didn't sign that petition i think it was only 1200 so ncr was kind of the debate was lost but a lot of people were pissed about the absolute discharge i think that's where that's was like a critical moment in this case so an absolute discharge like we were talking about means there are no conditions on release if he was given no a con conditions no conditions how is that possible there is no criminal record and he is set free that's it after you cannibalize somebody yeah if he was given in a conditional release, he might have been required for things like to stick to a treatment plan or regularly report to a counselor, things like that. But no, they just straight up let him go. That's absolutely absurd. Like, I can understand if he was had a conditional release and there was all these terms, you know, he's yeah. got a monitor on him. He has to check in. He has to you know, they absolutely make sure he's taking his meds. They're just trusting. They're fully trusting Vince and their process that it's a hundred percent effective. Yeah. And Vince publicly said, I'm will like, I would like to continue treatment. I hope that they, he was basically asking for a conditional release and they still didn't do it to prove a point. According to the medical professionals that treated him for almost a decade, they said he no longer posed a risk to the public now that he's on medication and the state believe that since he did everything that was required of him, he should be released. So Chris Somerville, the guy we talked about earlier, the CEO of the Schizophrenia Society of Canada, he met with Vince several times and he had this to say about the case, which I think is interesting. The media was more favorable to the McLean family because the country has entered a period of tough on crime with very little attention paid to restorative justice, rehabilitation, recovery, and redemption or the role of mental illness in this unfortunate incident. It is remarkable the positive effects of medication. Up to 25% of people who have a psychotic break will never experience another psychotic episode. 25%, he says? Up to 25%. Up not, to 25%? Yeah, that's not even that what? much. Dude, yeah. that's that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's a terrible that's not even good. Percentage there, 25. Like, I would be expecting with this kind of uh, of confidence, 99.99%. Right, yeah, that's chance. what it feels like. Uh, should 25, be. you should be happy with 25. Yeah, like, like, come on. And then he he has more stats, up to 65% will experience a degree of covering of, sorry, up to 65% will experience a degree of recovery in order to live a meaningful life, which, what, a little over half. 10% will take their life by suicide due to the losses associated with schizophrenia. Of the, thir three, of the 300,000 people in Canada who live with some sort of schizophrenia, the vast majority lead quiet lives, law-abiding. Where do you get that from, too? Quiet lives. What do, yeah. you, what do you got? Little How would you know? monitoring devices? Are you monitoring on? every single person that, it's just, out there? He's just, uh, it really sounds like PR, doesn't it? It just sounds like, oh, yeah, you know. Everything's good. Yeah, this is him talking more. People living with schizophrenia are more likely to be victims of violence rather than being perpetrators of violence, which that is true, but it's it's manipulating what's happening in this case. We're not talking about the other people suffering from schizophrenia. Yeah, We're yeah, talking why about is he ta this guy. Why isn't he talking about Vince here? Why is he just making these generalized statements? Exactly. And it, this is what I'd like to say to Chris. It's like, if you really believe, you know, let's put your money where your mouth is and say... If any of these people who you who you have studied and you're involved in treating, how about this? If they ever 
commit a violent act again, you're held liable and responsible for their actions. Now we're talking. And if Vince ever commits a violent act on another individual, harms them in any way, you will be charged as well. That, I would be totally done with that. Let's see that's, how his how this little speech changes. Yeah, that's what basically what Carol was saying. She's like, they have found a way to make no one responsible here. Right. Everybody's getting off the hook. Yeah. Except for the family that lost their loved one. Exactly. And, ha- and all the people that experienced the, the atrocities that happened that day. Yep. And live with them every single day. His yeah. Tim's screams are, are in their every waking moment and when they're asleep. It's like, what about those people? How are you guys going to fix everybody's PTSD? Yeah. And how are you going to bring their son back? You can't. So where nobody's taking responsibility. Yep. So how are they able to, you're so concerned about healing the mentally ill. What about the people that are going to deal with heartbreak for the rest of their life and the grief and potentially depression, other mental health? I mean, by, by letting people out who you have cured their mental health illness, you're in fact creating more mental health issues Yep. because you're, you're not, you're not giving these people some form of justice or closure and people are, are going to be traumatized for the rest of their lives because of what they witnessed that day. If they actually, if they actually wanted a PR statement on mental health and mental illness and rehabilitation, that's a great point that they would have then is the state providing for all of people's PTSD treatments, which we'll see here in a little bit. The answer is no, no. And they're in fact taking advantage of it. Exactly. So like if they actually wanted to make this thing into a big PR thing about mental health, they have completely disregarded other people who severely need it now after the events. Oh, it's just, this pisses me off so much. Like I just, I don't even know how Tim's family, I mean, if I, if I were Tim's family, I'd be like, I want to leave this country. Seriously. Like this is, this is absurd. Uh, there's just no way that and, you could go on knowing that the government literally let your son's killer go. And this is like, we've talked about rehabilitation before. I'm a hundred percent for re- rehabilitation. In this scenario, I am not convinced in the slightest. Well, apparently they got the secret formula. So how come we can't get that over here in the United States and get everybody treated and rehabilitated and back out to society? Right. Share your secrets. Yeah. Mm, there's there's something very fishy about this this whole thing. And I, I really question it and the authenticity and, you know, there, there's more than just, you know, there's people's egos on the line here and, and it's clearly wrapped up in all this and, and it's just sick. Yeah. Since the tragedy, the trial and the release of the killer, Tim's family members have no doubt suffered immensely. Tim's mother, Carol, sought out help after the death of her son. She reached out to a spiritual counselor through her Aboriginal elder who she found helpful she also joined MOVA, or Manitoba's Organization for Victims Assistance, and later joined the board. She often sees Greyhound buses in her hometown. At first, they were a reminder of the horrific tragedy, but now she tries to see them as the spirit of her son, Tim, checking in on her. Unfortunately, the McLean family members weren't the only ones to suffer from the tragedy on bus 1170. Many of the passengers on board still struggle with the trauma to this day. Let's hear from some of these eyewitnesses and see how PTSD affects their life. This woman was on the bus. She still can't get the sound of screaming out of her head. I thought it was just one of those scary movies. (laughs) We can't identify her or her daughter under child welfare laws. Two and a half years ago, social workers apprehended her baby. They said her PTSD made her an unfit mother. I'm constantly waking up depressed and not getting the proper help. Cook your food. The little girl lived in a foster home until a year ago when the court granted her grandmother guardianship and gave her mother access. She is a phenomenal joy. She's 
She mesmerizes everybody that comes in contact with her by her little voice and everything. She just, she's loved by everybody. Can you believe that shit? They'll let Vince Lee out, but they'll go and confiscate a woman's daughter from her due to her PTSD. That is evil, yeah. if you ask me. Uh, it's just such a like double standard there. And that's why I think there's like almost like this conspiracy within the mental health criminal justice system in Canada. Because how does this make any sense? The victims of this crime were not giving in, given any assistance when it comes to their mental health. And PTSD is a very, very real and serious mental disorder that uh, you could argue and say is just as dangerous as schizophrenia is. I mean, people who have PTSD, I mean, you look at the suicide rates, it's, it's insane. So it's like, how is it that they're picking and choosing? It's like, again, I think like you said, it's a PR stunt almost. It's like this PR thing for them. Like, oh, we took this absolutely brutal killer and turned them into a, a civilized member of society because of the treatment that we provided. Meanwhile, everybody who suffered at the hands of this guy are left untreated. How does that make any sense? Yeah, not only are they left untreated, they're being punished for it, basically. They're like, oh, now we're going to take your children away from you because of this PTSD illness that we didn't treat. Oh, it's sick, honestly. As for Stephen Allison and his wife, Isabel, Greyhound Canada paid for them to go through six counseling sessions. Wow. And gave them an additional $450 for the loss of their belongings. Stephen later said, seeing that is not something you can get over quickly. It made me a shell of my former self. I'm trying to get back to normal, but it's hard. Stephen was once an honor student with straight A's, but after the attack, he could barely get to class. He also struggled with talking to strangers. He used to be a friendly, outgoing person, but ever since the tragedy, he barely goes out anymore and rarely ever talks to people he doesn't know. The paranoia sets in and in the back of his mind, he's unsure if he's talking to another killer, experiencing a psychotic break. His wife, Isabel, ended up finding a part-time job after the tragedy and not going to school at all. They both followed the trial, but they couldn't bear to see Vince's face again. And they both have admitted that they've lost trust in strangers. As you can imagine, several lawsuits were filed against Greyhound, Vince Lee, the RCMP, the Attorney General, and the Government of Canada. Two passengers, Deborah Tucker and Kaylee Shaw, sued for $3 million in damages. Both suffered from severe anxiety, nervous shock, and depression. Kaylee couldn't work or study after the attack, and even her marriage and other relationships have failed since then. She later said, I've had a hard time hearing ambulance sounds, police cars. I freak out. I have to go through so much anxiety just to go out and do things. She began having nightmares of her standing on the side of Trans-Canadian Highway and seeing Vince holding Tim's severed head. He's slowly showing it off to her like a prize. The two women claimed that Greyhound was liable for failing to provide safe passage, failing to train staff appropriately, and failing to have adequate security at bus terminals and passenger points. The week following the attack, Greyhound Canada pulled their nationwide advertisements, which included the slogan, quote, there's a reason you've never heard of bus rage. What? They also ended up closing several bus routes in Western Canada. The women also claim the Canadian government is liable for failing to assure national transportation security and requirements under the Canada Transportation Act. And they claim the RCMP was liable for failing to remove Vince Lee from the bus in a timely fashion following the standoff. The two women dropped their lawsuit on July 14, 2015. As for the Good Samaritan truck driver that stopped, Chris Alguire wasn't able to go back to truck driving, and he's never been the same. He later said that Vince destroyed his life and his whole world has crashed down on him. He developed a constant feeling of always watching over his shoulder and he no longer likes being in large groups of people anymore. And he couldn't work his job as a truck driver after the incident. The passengers and Chris weren't the only ones to suffer from PTSD. The news reported on July 17, 2014 that one of the first RCMP officers to the scene had taken his own life. 
that doesn't tell you how serious this is, I don't know what will. Ken Barker recently retired from the RCMP and worked as a dog handler, but he struggled with PTSD for years. He was 51 at the time, and he had worked for law enforcement for over two decades before witnessing the Greyhound bus 1170 nightmare. He later got psychiatric help after the events, but his estranged wife Shari said the RCMP didn't do enough to help its own officers who suffered from PTSD. His illness didn't just force Ken to retire, it also cost him his marriage. Shari said, Ken and I separated three years ago, PTSD did it. It cost him on many levels, and he killed himself just before what would have been their 26th anniversary. He had declined rapidly over six months. He often sent Shari text messages like, I think I'm too broken to ever be fixed, and I wish I had cancer because then people would understand. Shari and her sister had saved him from a suicide attempt two months before, but they weren't able to get to him during his final attempt. As for Tim McLean's family, they will never forget the horrific way that Tim lost his life. In the summer of 2009, friends and family gathered together to remember Tim McLean at a vigil ceremony in front of the Manitoba Legislature building. Pictures of Tim were surrounded by flowers and candles, and the guests were able to share their memories of Tim with each other. As the years passed, Tim's mother, stepmother, and father still struggle with the closure and the horrific loss of life they had to think about daily. Their son died in one of the absolute worst ways possible. His murder is remembered as one of the most gruesome killings in all of Canadian history, and they won't ever be able to forget that. Let's listen to some thoughts from Tim Sr. about his son. Like his father, that's what we're left with, his memories. Still struggling to cope with the loss, he visits his son's gravesite every week. I sit and I talk with him. Talk I tell him everything. I just joke around about my day and how much we miss him and how sad it makes me. So to end this episode, we're going to end it by listening to Tim's family's thoughts and on how they're going to attempt to move forward after this horrific tragedy. But that'll be it for us today. We'll see you next week. I remember when this very first happened and for weeks and weeks, I was just mad and I was mad and I didn't really know exactly what I was mad about. And I was mad that the world just kept going on like nothing happened. Nothing changed for everybody else. It just, the traffic still went, the sun still shone. And it was so maddening to me that, that the whole world didn't just stop. Mine did. It stopped and it took a long time to really want to get up every day. I was given a few reasons to feel that way, to want to get up. Ten of them in total now, and they all call me Granny. I have as much fun with them as I can, as often as I can. Her son's death left a big hole in her life, but now she also sees some hope. And it took a long time to really want to get up every day. I was given a few reasons to feel that way, to want to get up. One of those reasons, a grandson. Five months after Timothy McLean's death, his son was born. I was in shock and then scared and then excited and then really worried. The mother was young, struggling to care for two other children by a different father. In 2016, a judge gave Dedeli permanent guardianship. He is a gift, a gift from God sent by my son to give me a reason to get up every day and to take care of. But for today, both parents want the focus to be on their son. He was just vibrant energy, and I so miss that in my world. He always lived his life the way he wanted to. We're trying to move on, but it's very hard. And I don't think, I don't think we'll ever be over it.